Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Ideas and Impact. I'm Frank Burry. I'm the chair of the board for the South Island Prosperity Partnership. And before we begin, I want to extend my sincere thanks to Myers Norris Penny for sponsoring today's event. And before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is within the traditional territories of the Lekongwen, Wazanak, Wozniak people, uh, and whose traditional lands we live, learn, and do our work. We acknowledge traditional hosts and honor their welcome and graciousness. Ideas and Impact was launched by the South Island Prosperity Partnership following Rising Economy Week, conference that we held in 2020 to introduce thought leadership and help us explore big ideas and their potential impacts on our region's future. In today's ideas and impact, we're going to talk about a big topic with a big impact, the Canada-US border. As vaccines roll out and the impact of border restrictions on our economies deepens, there's increasing calls for the reopening of the border. Today, we'll interview two people who spend their days immersed in this topic. I think you'll find it quite insightful. Our first guest is someone we connect with frequently on cross-border issues and economic development initiatives. Matt Morrison is a CFO for the Pacific Northwest Economic Region, or PENWARE, established in 1991 by a statute in the state, states of Alaska, Washington, Idaho, Montana, and Oregon, and the provinces of BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon, as well as the Northwest Territories. Kenware's mandate is to build re the region's economy while enhancing our natural environment. Matt is a leader in promoting innovation in the Canada-US border region. He's also a co-chair of the Futures Border Coalition, a group of public and private organizations bringing solutions to border issues. The FDC is currently working on COVID resilience and solutions to satisfy by easing border restrictions based on science and health standards. Our next guest is Dr. Lori Toutman, Director of Border Policy Research Institute at Western Washington University. Dr. Toutman engages in a range of research focus in the US-Canada border, particular, particularly in the Washington DC region. She participates in working groups, including the Canada-US Transportation Border Working Group. And she also co-chairs the Border Issues Working Group of the Pacific Northwest Economic Region and has been appointed to the Cascadia Innovation Corridor Steering Committees. Lori is a global fellow with the Woodrow Wilson Center and with the Canadian Global Affairs Institute. A couple of very, uh, well-read uh, speakers today. Now I'm going to turn over the discussion to our moderator, Carrie Slavens. Carrie's a director of engagement at South Island Prosperity and the former editor of Douglas Magazine. With extensive journalism and communications experience, Carrie has been bringing to light the stories that matter the most to our region for more than two decades. I look forward to today's session. There will be a Q&A later on and that should be very interesting. Uh, over to you, Carrie. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you so much, Frank, for that introduction. And uh, good morning, Matt and Lori, and to our audience. Uh, you know, Canada and the US, we share almost 9,000 kilometers of border across land and water. About a third of that is shared with Alaska alone. On an average day, and Matt and Lori will correct me if I'm wrong, about 30,000 trucks roll across the border with more than 1 billion in trade. And in pre-COVID times, about 15 million US tourists a year streamed across the border to Canada. Then of course, the border restrictions were put in place due to COVID. And while goods continued to flow, tourism ground to a halt. However, we now begin to see a bit of light at the end of the tunnel as vaccines are distributed. And we've seen a restlessness on behalf of some people and groups to open the border. Many people are asking for more of a plan or at least benchmarks. Meanwhile, our prime minister has said, maybe summer, maybe not. Today, we're gonna to look at the current situation and the implications with the border and restricted travel. Then we're gonna peer as much as we can into the future. And I think it's important to note here that while our two guests are very well informed about the border, 
these two do not have a magic wand to wave to reopen the border, at least not that I'm aware of. So um, it's uh, it's not in their hands. Matt and Lori, good morning. You good are morning. both part of a highly interwoven network in place between our nations that focuses on the border we share and works on issues from pre-clearance to technical innovations. So um, Matt, I'll start with you. Perhaps you can begin by setting the stage for us regarding the work you do through um, Pinware and other organizations you belong to and kind of, kind of lay the foundation for us. Well, thank you, Carrie. Uh, it is, uh, uh, this is the best region uh, throughout North America in terms of our interconnectedness between Canada and the US. And, uh, the Pacific Northwest Economic Region is a 30-year-old statutory nonprofit that was created by the states of Alaska, <clears throat> Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, the Yukon, and Northwest Territory. So we have five jurisdictions in Canada and five in the U.S. And we focus on the economic watersheds which flow north and south in the region. Um, we have 18 different working groups from transportation to invasive species, environment, energy, and border issues. It, border just uh, is in all of them. <laughs> so, so we have uh, <clears throat> had a long history of uh, pulling together legislators, business leaders in the 10 jurisdiction region and making recommendations to Ottawa and Washington, D.C. And I think we are known as a solutions uh, group, you know, not haranguing about <laughs> what's not working, but talking about real innovative solutions, how we can uh, make the border work better and how we can facilitate the commerce across the border more <clears throat> um, efficiently. So the other organization, um, we have always been involved in whatever the uh, soup du jour is for the U.S. Canada. Um, you know, there was the um, Canada-U.S. partnership back in the 90s, and then uh, there was the Smart Border Accord, and that moved to the um, uh, Beyond the Border Action Plan when Stephen Harper was Premier, Prime Minister, and then we now have a new roadmap for the Renew US-Canada partnership that the president and prime minister signed just two months ago. So we've been very involved in that. And uh, the Future Borders Coalition uh, came out of a group of mainly private sector entities working on how do we get pre-clearance to be more successful between Canada and the US. And uh, when COVID hit, we kind of shifted or pivoted to looking at the future of borders period in especially Canada and the US. And we have a number of um, task forces working on the land border, the marine border, the airport environment, and then the supply chain, uh, the cross border supply chains and uh, we have a lot of large companies involved in this effort. So I'm the co-chair of that with the uh, executive vice president of YVR, uh, Jerry Bruno. So those are the two organizations. And then maybe I'll pass it to Lori to talk about uh, the Cascadia Innovation Corridor, which I'm also involved in and, and her Border Policy Research Institute. Thanks, Matt, and thank you, Carrie, and good morning, everyone. So BPRI, the Border Policy Research Institute, has been around for about 15 years, and we were created really out of a recognition that after the events of the terror attacks on September 11th, 2001, the state of Washington really wanted to have a dedicated research institute to better understand the relationship between Canada and Washington State and mainly BC and Washington because the border here is really critical to our trade portfolio and to our communities. So um, we do a lot of research on the border. We are actually the only institute of our kind in the US and that we're an academically based research institute solely dedicated to understanding the Canada US border. And so a lot of that also involves outreach um, with a number of different collaborative networks. As you mentioned, Carrie, there's a lot of overlap um, 
Matt and I are involved in, I, I think, almost all of these efforts to one degree or another. The Cascadia Innovation Corridor is certainly a very important one that's becoming much more robust as it grows. And that effort, which many people will probably be familiar with, um, is supported by the governor and the premier. And it's really an effort to look at many different facets of the way that BC and Washington and Seattle and Vancouver and even Portland are tied together, whether that's through transportation networks, through our tech sectors, through our bio biosciences, and to figure out how we can grow into a resilient and sustainable mega region because we do share so much in common. And that, you know, building these things together will definitely strengthen our region as a, as a whole rather than doing them separately. Okay, that's great. And um, Lori, it's been a year, about a year since travel restrictions were first put in place. So can you give us a look at the border now, pre-COVID and now? What is still moving freely across the border? What isn't? What would people actually be surprised to know? Well, I won't dwell too much on the nature of the restrictions because I'm guessing many people are familiar with them, but essentially over the past year, the border has been restricted to what's considered non-essential travel. And that does vary whether you're heading to Canada or heading to the US. But a very key component of the restrictions is that essential travel has remain to, uh, to move pretty freely. And so that involves the movement of trucks and the movement of workers. And what we've seen in our region, which is pretty similar across the border, is that there was an initial dip in trade values and in the movement of goods that occurred right around the second quarter of 2020. So really around April, it coincided with the border restrictions, but we don't think there was any real correlation there because those trade values and truck volumes have since returned to their pre-pandemic levels, at least in our region. So we saw, we suffered a little bit, I think from supply chain disruptions, from factories being shut down due to COVID, but not necessarily because of the restrictions. So I think there's an overall feeling that the sort of essential component that was carved out of those restrictions has worked fairly well for, for trade and, and for most workers too. Um, the more difficult piece, of course, is the restriction on what's considered non-essential. So, you know, trade or tourism, visiting family, um, things that people in this region were doing very frequently and very often. Uh, for example, in 2019, we saw about 11 million travelers come into our land border here in Washington state from Canada. So that's not unique travelers, but that's a lot of people going back and forth and back and forth. Typically, Whatcom County, which is only about 225,000 people, sees about 5 million Canadian visits just for shopping, gas, mail, discretionary purposes again. So all of that has completely gone away. And our small county is looking at a, a revenue loss of around $250 million just because of the lack of Canadians. <clears throat> uh, Seattle as well depends very much on Canadians. Typically about 70% of all international visits to Canada or to Seattle are from Canada. And so they've seen a drop of about 1.7 million visits in 2019 to about 470,000. So, you know, across the board, of course, tourism is being um, hammered. Victoria as well, you know, we usually see about 50% of Americans crossing into BC overall or, or for tourism. That's about 4 million people on average. And then the Clipper and the Coho bringing US folks to Canada and vice versa have about a $200 million Canadian impact on Victoria every year, and that's essentially dried up completely. So, you know, those impacts are, are pretty severe um, and they are gonna remain in place for us as long as we, we know at least for a, another month for sure, probably longer. Wow, Matt, do you have anything to add to that? Well, um, I was gonna, Lori did a study for <clears throat> the government of Canada on border states. And what did you mention about that, Laurie? It's kind of interesting in that, in the backdrop of, of COVID, why Washington is unique. Yeah, so when we were talking about this panel, I said, I won't be all doom and gloom um, because there is some good stuff that's happened, particularly in our region. So uh, as I mentioned, you know, trades flowed pretty well. We've recovered to our pre-pandemic trade values and Washington's GDP was one of only two northern border states that's also recovered to our pre-pandemic levels. And that's really important for British Columbia because a strong Washington economy has a positive effect for BC. You know, typically um, in 2019, 
Washington state purchased about $14.7 billion US dollars of goods from Canada, much of that from BC, obviously all of that moving through our ports. And I think part of the recovery, the strong recovery we've seen in Washington state is because our tech sector and our biosciences sector has been so um, performed so well over the past year. And that's not necessarily the case in other regions where there's much more of a dependence on manufacturing, for example. Okay. And I think, uh, yeah, we've seen uh, our tech sector here um, really, uh, you know, do well throughout the pandemic just because of the nature of the, the industry. Matt, Wendy Paradis of the Association of Canadian Travel in Agencies recently said the restart for travel and tourism won't come with a magic date, but rather a set of conditions which could include the number of COVID cases, number of hospitalizations, number of Canadians or Americans vaccinated, and the development of vaccine verification tools. What are your thoughts on this? Are there any initiatives in place to begin developing these kinds of benchmarks? Absolutely, Carrie. And, you know, we have really pushed both federal governments to move away from the European view of just uh, how many cases per 100,000. What, what we are hoping is that we get to the point where both countries welcome no, low risk, healthy travelers. So the, the issue we have been really focused on is how do we certify the low risk traveler? And this is, this is exactly the process we went through after 9-11, which led to the Nexus program that came out of CanPass. And the whole idea was to uh, focus on a risk-based approach to the border. <clears throat> and so, now we have to find ways of developing a certification for lower risk uh, people going either direction. And there's been a, a, a big backlash about even calling something a, a health immunization passport. We're throwing that word out the window, but we are trying to work on certification for both vaccinations and testing. So that, and I should say, you know, Penware just last week was a recipient of a nearly million dollar grant uh, from the federal government to, we, to work on this, it's called Congregate, a solutions accelerator to safely reopen tourism, hospitality and performing arts because our performing arts sector is, has been decimated. So in a, in a domestic context, we're trying to do, how do, how do we allow for a certification, a digital certification process that can let people into stadiums, uh, valet companies and, and the performing arts and, and on and on. And that needs to be tested and implemented uh, and that can lead toward uh, solutions that could work at the border. Okay, and yes, you noted that there has been a heavy opposition. The New York Times recently reported a fierce debate kicking off across the US on whether a digital health certificate should be required to prove immunization. It's been brought up in Canada as well. So Laurie and Matt, what are your thoughts on the actions taken by the European Union? This week, EU governments reached a deal on technical standards for the so-called vaccine passports um, that could allow for the resumption of hassle-free travel without quarantine requirements um, for vaccine pass holders. They're thinking by June, airlines and industry groups have already introduced apps that are capable of incorporating that information. So any thoughts on the EU's approach? Lori, maybe we'll start with you. Oh, I, Matt probably has more to say about that, but I mean, we have to start somewhere and there's a lot of different apps out there. And so I think it's a good first start to actually have a formal agreement on, on what that information needs to look like and what the privacy protections are because it, it's a little willy nilly right now with how many different things are being developed. So I think that's part of, might be part of what's holding us back is that we don't have that starting point to go from to implement that technology. Okay, Matt, would you like to pick up on that? Well, our number one <clears throat> request, I guess to Ottawa is 
is to work with the U.S. and develop a plan of requirements. And we, we, the private sector needs to have that. <clears throat> so there are discussions going on. Uh, Canada has, uh, has the Arrive Can application, which they are putting a lot of effort into. And uh, of course, the U.S. has developed its own CBP-1. Uh, and we're trying to say, let's <clears throat> make whatever you do interoperable and make sure that the back ends can communicate with each other so that we don't have so many different systems that the traveler is very confused. And um, <clears throat> so now is the time to be developing those in tandem. And that's been our number one push. Also <clears throat> requesting of the government of Canada to have an advisory committee with private sector organizations that depend upon the border to be a part of this process. Because what we've seen is, you know, here we are in, in, in Seattle, we've got, you know, Microsoft, Amazon, these guys are smart and know how to deliver things quickly. And uh, it's really the private sector that's going to come up with the solutions that we need. But the government has to work in a, in a way of defining the requirements that are necessary. Okay, so. that must be a very complex series of talks and go. I mean, it's not as simple as uh, Justin uh, Trudeau calling um, Joe Biden and saying, hey, dude, uh, is it? I mean, it must be very complex. What, what does that look like? How many teams are on this? How many people are involved? Well, we have been having uh, a lot of, uh, of private webinars with <clears throat> the government representatives from both Ottawa and DC, and they are talking to each other. And um, there's, there's just, uh, there's so many, as you said, it's very complex. There's discussions about antigen tests versus PCR tests and which <clears throat> is the most effective and <clears throat> the private sector <clears throat> airports are very concerned about the time uh, <clears throat> it takes for people to get a PCR test and be certified negative or COVID free. Uh, but the, it has to be health based and it has to be scientific and we, we have had enough time to develop these requirements. So we keep pushing on that. And one thing, Carrie, I would add to that is, you know, things have moved slowly for a lot of different reasons, which we can talk about if people are interested in that. But I think an important point to highlight to folks is that, you know, these agencies, the border agencies and the health agencies weren't typically in close relationship with each other, especially when it came to border operations. So for example, in the United States, you know, the CDC, I think only just came out recently and has sort of given an authority to CBP to be involved in health information. And I think the same is true with CBSA, the Canada Border Services Agency and other health authorities in Canada. So those relationships had to start in a very confusing time and a very overwhelming time for both or all agencies involved. And then you add on that the complicated layer of binational relations, relations, which had been Trump and Trudeau and are now Biden and Trudeau. So all of these layers, given the health uncertainty around the virus itself and, and what this pandemic really looks like has really made it difficult to make progress on border easing or border recovery. It's interesting. We've talked about how the pandemic has accelerated so many innovations and whatnot. Um, it sounds like it's accelerating a lot of relationships too. And um, do you see that a lot of positives as well coming out of it in terms of our two countries talking to each other at various levels? I mean, I would say I see it on the ground for sure. Um, we've had a number of more intense and more 
intentional cross-border discussions and relationships because now we have this crisis, right, that we have to sort of figure out how to work through together. And that's been very healthy for our region, I think, and for also our region connecting to broader relations in DC and Washington, because again, we have this kind of problem that we have to solve. And typically the Canada-US border is not really approached that way. It's it's like an issue-based sort of, you know, pre-clearance maybe is the issue that we're working on. But the urgency is not so much there because people aren't being divided necessarily. So I think that it has helped a lot regionally and locally with building relationships. And I won't, I'll let Matt talk um, more about the national scale stuff, but I'll just say briefly that, you know, I think before the pandemic, we were really on the cusp of a new era of border management, which was much more technologically driven. And we were just sort of hovering in this place. And I think the pandemic has really given some visibility and some leverage to the importance of the border and the importance of doing things more efficiently and more safely. And so, you know, the risk of the virus has drawn our attention to doing things more touchlessly, more, more virtually. And those, those ways are also much more efficient than the ways we currently have done them in the past. Okay. Matt, um, do you have any yeah. thoughts? I think this will lead to uh, <clears throat> maybe a leapfrog uh, forward in terms of efficiency at the border. Uh, there's so many ways we've been working for decades on uh, paperless, um, you know, I mean, just two, three years ago, <clears throat> they were collecting change and money from truck drivers at the border. And, <clears throat> you know, this is silly. So um, we're getting to uh, an era, uh, the technology is, is really being pushed to make a much more efficient border. And we should emerge from this uh, as a more connected, more efficient, safer, more secure uh, border processes. So that's the positive that we're, uh, we're, you know, moving forward in that direction. You know, just two weeks ago, they decided that Nexus card holders could actually be interviewed uh, uh, on Zoom, <laughs> you know, they could, they could update their Nexus card or <clears throat> um, uh, on a virtual process. And it, it was very cumbersome before. We've been talking about this for years. Can't we do a virtual interview? But uh, finally, we're going to get that. That's amazing. That's an example. Yeah, that's great. And a, a lot of people um, don't realize, you know, um, that actually the border restrictions expire and are renewed every 30 days right now. Right. <laughs> is, that, is that just like stamping a thing or is that complicated as well? Well, we, we, we since June have said, let's get a plan so that everyone knows when these conditions are met, then we'll begin a phased reopening of the border or easing restrictions. Right. And we're still uh, hoping that plan will emerge here um, with private sector input and support. Okay. Well, I'm going to uh, turn for a minute to tourism um, because that has mm -hmm. been very affected by this. And uh, tourism cruise ships polls show Canadians continue to have big fears of reopening the border as much as we really do probably crave it. Um, but we um, lament the missing tourists. Um, and what's, tourism's done an admirable job, but they're really just hanging on a lot of them. So, and Alaska's desperate for tourists uh, because the cruise ships have stopped. So what do we have to do? to set up the return of the so-called two nation vacation. What's, what's involved in this? Well, this, this congregate uh, pro accelerator that we're building now, uh, we have been in discussions with the uh, BC Supercluster and Western Economic Diversification. And I hope that we'll be able to do some testing in Vancouver and in Seattle with uh, venues to <clears throat> um, test similar uh, technologies so that, um, I mean, the cruise lines have made uh, lots of plans of how they think people can cruise safely. And there are uh, cruises happening in the Mediterranean and in other places now, or in this summer. Uh, they feel that uh, when people are fully vaccinated, that 
there's a much less risk of, of COVID. So um, I think it's both the CDC and also um, Health Canada that are, um, you know, I know that everyone was shocked when Canada said February 2022 and, and just kind of didn't, uh, didn't allow for much dialogue with the private sector. And I, since you're there in Victoria, I, I am so uh, concerned about the Victoria Clipper and the Coho that serve Victoria. And, you know, they've been out of business for over a year and, and they, had to, they had to lay off everybody and they can't start it in 30 days. You know, it, it, it'll take four to six months just to get people rehired and, and begin a, a so so they really need a clear roadmap mm -hmm. and and it's really important for um, for the governments to do that yeah yeah absolutely. and I, I think an equally important part is is the huge public messaging and relations campaign that's going to happen alongside restarting tourism which is ensuring the public that tourism is safe and congregating in certain places is safe because you know we can open the border and we can restart industries but to really get people moving and get them out there again I think is going to take some some good messaging as well yeah okay that's a good point um so Lori uh the Wilson Center Task Force is a nonpartisan group and they were charged with studying how to reopen the Canada U.S. border um, I know members of that include uh, former politicians Jean Charest, Anne McLennan from Canada, Christine Gregoire and James Douglas from the US. And uh, my understanding is that in March, panelists presented their initial findings on how travel restrictions have affected border communities over the past year. What else, what have you seen emerging that may be interesting or surprising from the Wilson Task Force? Well, one of the key components to that discussion that we had in March was making clear the urgency around addressing the border restrictions because, you know, to a certain extent, the fact that freight flows and, and trade and essential travel has moved fairly well has come at the cost of, of kind of obscuring what hasn't been moving very well. And some of that, a lot of that is tourism, a lot of that is small businesses, and a lot of it is just people and families that have been separated and are really suffering mental health issues because they can't be with their loved ones. They can't say goodbye to their loved ones. And so we, we're trying to create sort of this sense of urgency that something has to be done. You know, that might not be opening the border tomorrow when there's a huge outbreak happening in Canada, but as, as Matt has said, developing a plan and drawing attention to the importance of that plan by highlighting really the, the costs of the restrictions. And I think, you know, we're at the point now, in the beginning of this pandemic, the, the division between essential and non-essential made a lot of sense, right? It, it worked fairly well for kind of an acute policy response. But we really are at the point now where we can start to move people back and forth for any trip purpose if they can prove, you know, they've been vaccinated and they've tested and they're not carrying COVID. Like we have the tools to resume border operations safely. And so, you know, the, the ur sharing that message around the urgency of every day the border is closed, businesses and families are continuing to suffer is a very important message to, to push that policy agenda along. And that's a very good point you've made because a lot of people say we shouldn't sacrifice health for economics, but it's really not a question of that, is it? Is I don't. I don't think it is. I think in the beginning, there might have been a trade off there. Um, but now that now it's certainly not a trade off because we do have the tools and the monitoring in place. And again, you know, the growing number of, of vaccinated individuals is a very important safety measure that we didn't have a year ago. So yeah, absolutely. Um, Victoria, Vancouver, Seattle, Portland, all make up part of the Cascadia region. Um, of the Pacific Northwest, um, so-called mega region. Um, how might our region map be better positioned to manage the situation we're in and survive it than other regions? We've talked about technology, but are there other things that give us strength in this region? Well, certainly it's our relationships. Uh, we have the most interconnected uh, relationship 
between Canada and the U.S. on the entire North American um, continent. And, and things like the Cascadia Innovation Corridor are, you know, have pivoted to say, we need to use our talent to address the challenges we're facing right now and solve some of these issues together. And, and that's really terrific. And uh, we will emerge out of this stronger and more connected and more efficient as a region. I, I'm very confident about that. And I think that um, we, uh, we can never lose sight for our, my tourism friends. You know, we, we are the best place on earth. And we have a destination that the whole world would love to come and visit and see. And we have to emerge out of this to say, we're not only the best place on earth, we're also the safest place. And we're the place where we have addressed this challenge together in a, in a way that other people can see. That was really an intelligent and um, you know, you, you've done a great job and, and we need to keep that kind of message because, you know, places like uh, Bouchard Gardens have spent millions and millions of dollars to advertise globally the destination. And we need to really recognize that investment and ensure that we come out of this stronger and with, with a sense that this is the place um, where solutions lie. Okay, that's a really good point, Lori. Anything to add there? I mean, I was going to say the same thing: relationships and and also the organizations that support those. Um, you know, these these don't exist in other regions. Um, this is really the only place where there's institutions and organizations whose day job it really is to foster those relationships. And if you look at places like. Michigan and Ontario or New York and Ontario, some of those corridors that are integrated in some ways through tourism or through supply chains, um, they're not necessarily integrated through collaborative relationships that support um, sort of a shared common goal. There's some territorial issues, there's political issues, but out here, we, I think we almost sometimes take for granted that we really sort of get along and we play well together. And for the most part, we like each other. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. So we're looking at this pandemic. Well, you know, a lot of experts are saying with climate change, various factors, this isn't gonna be the only pandemic in our future, you know, that we're gonna face. And uh, so what can you tell us about what considerations are being made to making this whole process better or more efficient the next time around? Very good point. Um, one of the things that Penward did was we also got a grant from uh, the US Economic Development Administration to, to look at our pandemic plan and pandemic uh, response plan and update it. So we're, we're just beginning that process of looking at what did we learn in the past year that we can do better in the next pandemic? What are the institutionalized things that we need to uh, put in place so that um, we're better prepared for the future. Um, and you brought up climate change. I think it's, it's very important to look at the, the incredible advances that we are making throughout the region uh, in terms of, of clean energy and clean technology and the commitment that our, our large industries have in <clears throat> moving in that direction. And that's a, a very positive um, a very positive message, message to the rest of the world that uh, we're working together, we're addressing key issues. And um, I think under, underneath our push to Ottawa and DC is we want that messaging to come out of this uh, process that we did it together. I think that's great. Lori, anything to add to that? 
I guess I'd, I'd put on my research hat and say it's really important that we have ongoing research efforts to understand the current state of the way things work so that when a crisis emerges, we have the tools in place to understand how to address it. And I think the COVID-19 pandemic and the border restrictions are a great example of that. You know, we had a lot of data to help us understand what the impact, for example, of Canadians are on the Washington state economy so that when that border restriction went into place, we could really estimate what the cost of that was. And if we didn't have that research and that data, we would be sort of in the dark about you know, the impact of those restrictions and looking at if we ever had to do those restrictions again, what sectors might require a little extra um, financial support or what places might be more affected by these different policy tools. Okay. Um, well, I want to, um, you know, this may be a tough question, but if either of you were asked to give advice to a business owner, say the owner of a hotel or a large tourism company about preparing for reopening, either mentally or taking action within their company, what would you tell them? Um, I know you can't tell us when the border is going to open, um, but what would you tell them to help them kind of prepare? Well, to be up to date with the latest uh, cleaning and, you know, understanding uh, what, because there are, there are a lot of new things that have come out of this in terms of deep cleaning and uh, touchless surfaces and all of those things are important. And it's really about how people, how the traveling public is going to feel safest. And, um, making sure that there's a system for your employees to be uh, tested regularly and to <clears throat> abide by all the um, necessary CDC regulations or whatever. I, I think it's, it's largely uh, how do we, and, and I'm sure it's happening domestically. Our, our domestic tourism is, is really starting to kick off here. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure it is up there as well. I mean, you're, you're the, uh, the place where people would go from a lot of the um, a lot of Canada, so um, I think it's just more of the same. Really looking at how to convey that it's safe. Mm -hmm. Didn't you tell me um, that the airlines, domestic airlines in the U.S., are actually pretty much back to normal? There, in many areas, they're up to seventy to eighty percent. Um, of pre-COVID levels. So yeah. there, there's a pent up demand. Americans are tired of sitting at home and not going anywhere. So uh, with 50% vaccinated, once people are vaccinated, they feel more confident to go out. And, you know, they, they are all, you know, everyone is, is wearing masks, but uh, there, there is a pent up demand and, and it's going to explode once we get, once we get uh, to this 70 or 80% vaccination level. Okay, we're, we're going to, this has been absolutely fascinating and we're going to move into the Q&A section. We have a few questions coming up. Uh, before we do, do either of you have any closing thoughts around uh, this or anything we haven't brought up that you think is vital to mention? I guess I would say that there, there's sort of a, a good and a bad, right? There's a lot of work being done, a lot of private sector involvement, a lot of government involvement to figure out how we move beyond the situation that we're in. But that said, it's going slow. Um, and it's going slow for sometimes understandable reasons. I mean, right now, obviously, we're not going to be easing restrictions between Canada and US, given what's happening in Canada. But the development of this plan is what really needs to be pushed. And I think that's where Matt kind of highlighted this private sector can have a role in, in pushing this and really drawing attention to the urgency of having just a plan in place um, so that people can begin to think about, you know, what the summer might look like, for example. And that's really, really important. Okay. Matt? Uh, we are just trying to make voluntary um, uh, pilots, we would like to have a voluntary system where <clears throat> Nexus card, card holders could upload their digital vaccination record or their test results and uh, be allowed to, uh, uh, in a limited fashion, uh, test this at the border. So, you know, we have Point Roberts people that can't, 
go to the rest of the country. And uh, we, we would like to do a limited pilot to prove the concept that this, this would be one way of a voluntary um, eased re easing of restrictions. Okay, that's great. Well, I'm gonna move on to some of our questions here. Uh, the first one, on confidentiality and privacy of health records, can there be a harmonized certifying approach like passports between states and provinces or federal health authorities across the border for low risk travelers. Well, we've already talked about that a little bit, but yeah, let's look at the confidentiality and privacy concerns. I'm sure that weighs in. Well, I'll just say that it's absolutely the fundamental, uh, it has to be designed into any solution. And the, the discussions we've had with CBP and CBSA would be where uh, like this nexus pilot the uh, digital health record um, the the would the, uh, the the nexus would ping a database and just get a red light or a green light a yes or no rather than have the actual data that because we have very severe uh, limitations on health data in terms of privacy so what we're looking at is a, um, a data ping to the uh, registered or certified um, uh, center in a state or a province. And it would just say yes or no, that's all. Uh, but it's a huge issue and, and very smart people are, are working on how to make sure that health data is not uh, available or, or, or could be taken. Okay, that's great. Um, now some, just carrying on that theme, uh, we have a question where somebody has asked about the future of labor mobility. Can a future Nexus or visa program help facilitate workers who are US citizens living in Canada or vice versa? Um, and then this person has added, I guess the tax challenges make it tough given Washington versus BC income tax rates. But that's even more of a pressing question now that we have so much remote working going on. Would anybody like to take that on? I would just say that we're, we're in a new era. And, you know, if you're working remotely, where are you working? <laughs> and <laughs> which, which jurisdiction should be taxing you. Uh, all of these things are wide open policy discussions and we're going to be having a lot of them at the Penworth Summit this summer because we're looking at all workforce, education, we're, we're catapulted into a new era that we haven't seen before. And I, I think this it is a great question about uh, workforce mobility and and where, where are you working and where do you need to be certified? And um, hopefully we can have uh, a broader quest, you know, discussion about this uh, with policymakers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Somebody has asked here, um, will Americans actually now feel safe crossing the Canadian border? <laughs> Give it interesting. So smug here. It's an interesting question. Um, I, you know, I think that um, the attitude towards COVID was just, it's just been so different in both of our countries. And you have to remember in the United States, we have you know, what, 330 million people. I mean, we're an enormous country. And so depending on where you are, that attitude changes. I think it may be more unified in, in Canada than it is here. And so, you know, in Washington state, I think we've taken the pandemic very seriously and our governor had a mask mandate pretty early on. And we've been pretty conservative about about the pandemic and our, our relationship to it. Um, that said, you know, I don't know, we've seen um, so many people meeting up, for example, at Peace Arch Park, which has been overrun by Americans and Canadians who they're gonna get together no matter what. Um, that's pretty clear, the people in that park, right? And so I think there's a lot of people that when they can go to Canada, they will. And remember, you know, we're probably looking at vaccinated travelers who are gonna be less concerned about contracting the virus because you know the chances become quite low. Yeah, and I mean, that's really interesting. Matt, what have you been hearing out there? Oh, people, uh, there's so many property owners from uh, who are just desperate to get up to their property. And um, I, I think that there's a, a keen interest to, 
to be uh, visiting Canada. And um, I think as soon as there's a, a path forward that will work, um, things can can begin quite quickly. Um, you know, I'm going to just move away. One of the questions here is about the Nexus program in general. Um, and this person says Nexus, the Nexus program currently has about 1.83 million users. I don't, I don't know if that's correct. Given the importance and extent of the Canada-US trade relationship, shouldn't this number be way higher? This person is asking, what does the future of Nexus look like and how will it incorporate new ways of making cross-border activities more efficient or attractive? Well, I'll start with that one. I and mean, we do have the FAST program, the Free and Secure Trade program, which is sort of the commercial equivalent to Nexus. So truck drivers have a parallel trusted um, traveler program. But I think part of the reason it's so low is because it's pretty confusing and it's frankly quite difficult to figure out how to apply for the card. I mean, my mother tried to apply for it. She lives in New Jersey. And for her to get an interview scheduled and to figure out the difference between the different programs in the US, I had to walk her through it and even I got a little bit confused. Um, so it should be easier to enroll in. I mean, the application fee is quite simple. The actual application is simple, but the, the requirement for an in-person interview and the difficulty in getting that in-person interview, I think is partially what's limited enrollment in the program. I also think that um, the Nexus program would benefit greatly from a huge public relations outreach campaign. I know both governments in the US and Canada love the program. It's seen as a huge success and would be very keen to get more people involved. And I think Nexus is a great example of something we were talking about earlier, which is how do we sort of leverage this crisis to leapfrog in our border policies. And this is a tool where you know, you're not touching a document um, and the officer's not touching your passport. And it's such a seamless, you know, public health safety kind of process compared to the typical passport that I think now there's a huge um, benefit to a, sort of an additional benefit beyond security and efficiency to getting more people enrolled in that program. And that's the protection of public health. So the ability to renew a Nexus, Nexus membership virtually, as Matt mentioned earlier, is going to help the program a lot. I think there's I can't remember the numbers, but there's a huge, huge backlog. I think it's several hundred thousand people that have been waiting over the past year to either renew or to apply. So I think we'll see an expansion of the program, um, particularly as, as virtual options become available. And in our region here, we have the most Nexus users of anywhere along the Canada-US border. And the more people here that are enrolled in that program, the faster and more efficient and I think safer the border will be for everybody on both sides who are crossing. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, what are your thoughts um, on advocacy at the US Canadian national level to ensure the voices and interests from the Cascadia region, Pinware are listened to? How effective do you think the Wilson Task Force has been on this front? That's a question from one of our um, audience. Matt, maybe I'll throw that to you. Well, I would just, uh, say that thinking about Nexus and going back to when uh, <clears throat> Governor Gregoire was the governor of Washington and and she worked so well with uh, Gordon Campbell uh, before the Olympics to get the enhanced driver's license, which in the beginning, neither fe federal government was willing to do. And we, I mean, this was uh, you know, we had weekly calls for probably six months with Washington, D.C., and Ottawa to get that thing implemented. So uh, we, we, we can do things if we have the political um, desire. And uh, I think that, you know, our, our region is really seen as a place of innovation, and I think we can make a big difference. So... Um, Yes, I, I think we, we can really, um, uh, we can do this. <laughs> we can yes. do this, yeah. That should yeah. be our new slogan. Um, and um, in terms of, uh, you know, it might be worth focusing for just a moment um, on the Cascadia mega region. And I'd like you both to kind of address um, a lot of people, you know, talk about Cascadia, but let's talk about exactly what it is, what makes it so unique and, what in fact are mega regions? Um, are they economic units? What, what are they? 
that's a big question, Carrie. <laughs> question, but you know what? We talk about Cascadia, and I think it's important that if we're working together as a block in Cascadia, that we understand what it is. Yeah, I, maybe I'll just speak to the, what I see comparatively in other regions. And I think what Cascadia has that other regions don't is a common ethos. I wouldn't say identity necessarily, but a common ethos. So we have this shared, um, you know, sort of way of life that it's very related to the outdoor environment. Um, we're very far from Ottawa and DC. We're kind of way out here and doing things on our own. And I think we share enough of these common, whether it's political or environmental um, or cultural, you know, dual citizenships, for example, we share enough of that, that that's like the basic ingredient for any sort of thing you'd call a mega region because we have to have enough in common to see the value of building things together. And then that I think evolves into integrated economies, integrated transportation systems that benefit both sides of the border. And so to me, that mega region concept sort of starts from that ground up shared ethos and then expands into other social or economic sectors um, that have a sort of recognized value on, on both sides and are very coordinated and integrated as well. Okay, Matt? And we will keep pushing for Victoria to be in, <laughs> in the region uh, because you're, you're closer to Seattle than Vancouver and you, you definitely deserve to be part of Cascadia. Yes, thank you. Um, we like to, uh, I know we talk about the, the corridor, um, but we like to, as our CEO Emily has said, we like to think of it as more of a triangle. Yeah, I want, and when you think about transportation being such a key connector, you know, whether that's air, air service or ferries or rail or highways, I mean, certainly Victoria is very tied in to yeah. Washington. So yeah, I think so. Um, well, we've, um, we've come to the end of our hour and you have both been uh, so informative and uh, really I've learned a great deal about the border and, um, you know, I think we all appreciate your work in, um, you know, helping to um, look toward a reopening that is safe and secure. Everybody wants that. And um, it's, I know that's your main focus as well. Um, any final thoughts before we head off? Just uh, very positive that we're going to do it and we'll do it together and we'll be the safest, healthiest, most wonderful place to visit. That's the vision that I you know, want everybody to see as, as we get through the variants and all this stuff, we have to have that vision and make sure that, that the messaging is leading us there. Yeah, and I'd just say we have, we have the tools now and we have the expertise and what's gonna get us there, I think is the relationships that support those efforts. And those are very key here in our region. Mm -hmm. I would be remiss if I didn't ask does anybody want to take a guess about border reopenings? That's a really unfair question. But um, I mean, any it, it, will, it will be a, a phased easing of the border. It's not going to be uh, just open. But um, I'm, I'm hopeful that as the vaccinations continue to increase um, and the science uh, continues to get better and our testing regimes are better, that we will see uh, an easing of the restriction yeah. by summer. Uh, that's what I was going to say. I think maybe we can expect some easing by summer. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's good to know. And, um, you know, I want to thank you both for being here today. You were both just wonderful guests to have, and we will definitely have you back. Uh, as we talk more about Cascadia, borders, um, opportunities. I also want to thank today members of our audience for tuning in and of course our sponsors MNP. Stay tuned for our next Ideas and Impact on May 20th when Dr. Miles Druckmann, an international expert in health security, returns by popular demand after his appearance at Rising Economy Week. If you really want the facts on the pandemic and our future, you do not want to miss Miles Druckmann's talk. Thank you to everybody for being here today. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye now.